So what we've concluded so far is that everything we can see really isn't a very important part of the universe. So now let's think about the bits you can't see. You might call that the dark universe, if you like. And everyone will have heard of dark matter. In fact, next week's lecture is entirely on dark matter, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on dark matter now. But there is lots of evidence out there for dark matter. Uh, and the simple thing to think, say is that if I have some object, right, orbit of one object around another, then I have the acceleration is just v squared over r, and that's equal to gm over r squared. That's just here, that's just circular motion. And you just equate that to the gravitational acceleration. And that tells me that V is equal to the square root of GM over R. I.e. the further away from an object... the lower the orbital velocity. Pretty straightforward. You see that uh, in the solar system, for example, Mercury zips around very quickly, Jupiter moves around more slowly. All right, so this is absolutely something that works. Newtonian mechanics works very well. Formally, if I wanted to look at something much bigger, I'd have to worry about whether or not the mass was really point-like or not. So, you know, if I looked at a galaxy, for example, if I look at a galaxy, then actually I have some intensity, and I can use that, as I just did earlier, for a proxy of mass, which is equal to some intensity in the middle, and it's normally what's called an exponential disk. So in other words, this is my central intent. This is my intensity at some distance. This is my central intensity. That's my distance again, and this is what's called a scale length. So there's an intensity of light and therefore an intensity of mass which falls off as you go away. So in other words, the center of galaxies is the most dense and it becomes less dense as you go along. And what that means is that you write V is equal to the square root of G M as a function of R over R. And so this doesn't necessarily go down if M of R is increasing faster than R. And you can imagine, for example, if I have a, a uniformly filled sphere, the mass inside it goes as the volume, you know, volume times density, and the volume goes as R cubed. So if I had a uniformly filled sphere, then in fact my mass of R would go up faster than R, and therefore the velocity could still increase. And so what I expect to see in a galaxy is I expect to see a rising rotation curve, i.e. velocities increase with distance. And then eventually, of course, I run out of galaxy, and then it behaves just like a point source inside it, and it turns over beyond the visible galaxy. I get the r to the minus a half law. So what I would expect to see, if I plot here v and here r, I would expect to see something that looks like this. 
ultimately go as I utter the half. And what I actually see is not that at all. Oh, I haven't got a figure for it. What I actually see is something which looks very different to this. I actually see something which rises up here. I've deleted that by accident. Let's try that again. What I actually see is not something which does this. It's something which does this. This is a known problem of called the flat rotation curves in galaxies. And the thing is here, the galaxy, and if you look in the PDF, there is an image for this. The galaxies here, right, are sort of something like this sort of size. Right, so this is, you know, they don't have a defined edge, of course. Galaxies have fluffy edges. But a galaxy is much smaller. You can measure individual stars or gas or something a much larger radio than the bulk of the galaxy. So flat rotation curves in galaxies well beyond most of the stellar mass. And what that means is that M of R increases continuously not necessarily super fast but it increases it continuously to keep the rotation curves flat and in turn that means that there is some component That we can't see and we call that dark matter and in many galaxies dark matter is somewhere between even five and even a hundred times the visible matter and what that means in turn is that you can come up with a total matter density which is equal to omega baryon plus omega dark matter, which is equal to 0 0.04 plus 0 0.23 equal to 0 0.27 of the critical density. So in other words, most of the matter in the universe, you can't see. It's also quite clear it is not normal baryonic matter, not atoms of the normal type that you can see around you now. Um, there's various constraints on that. It's something exotic and different, and we'll talk about that more next time. So omega m, in fact, omega m plus omega r, is equal to about 0 0.27 times the critical density. So we still look like we are in a negatively curved open universe. But what would be very handy is a way to actually access the total curvature of the universe and just weigh everything all at once. And that's something that is provided by the cosmic microwave background.